Hello everyone, welcome to a brand new episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to like and subscribe to stay up to date on all our latest releases. My guest for this interview is Craig Scott. He has over 30 years experience in the market and you may have seen him on Benzinga or CNBC. He currently owns his own private equity firm and he runs the Twitter account Infinity Trades X, which provides free market insights as well as knowledge into investing and trading. So Craig sat down with me to discuss his own views on the current market, uh, different trade methods that he likes, and as well as to answer the questions you guys submitted through Twitter. So let's go ahead and hop into it, and I hope you guys enjoy. All right. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak with me today. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you about was the Infinity Trades page that you started and how long you've been doing that for. Um, I think it's about a couple of years now. Um, so what happened was I had a personal account and I was kind of mixing different groups that I was involved in. I'm like, you know, involved in a, my Steelers fan page and I was tweeting about mental health and then there was finance stuff. So it got a real convoluted with different crowds. And then I, I started getting like hundreds of DMs a day asking for trades and what do I buy and what do I sell? And I, and I, and then I think I made a post that I'm going to create a new account that's going to be locked and it's only mm -hmm. going to let in people um, you know, that, that meet certain criteria that really want to learn and not just, you know, make the quick flip and try to, you know, the get rich quick kind of things. And it would always be free and there's no, um, kind of gimmick with it. It's just kind of an exchange of information and ideas between people who kind of want to learn the markets and how to invest and, and how to trade. And uh, it's been going pretty well. I mean, there was a lot more people in it. I just did a recent cleanse just because I found that, you know, it was starting to get um, a little too riffraffy for me and, and, and mm -hmm. kind of getting back to the way it used to be. So it, it's, 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 it's at a good level right now. So that's pretty much what we do. We, I, I go in, I post my thoughts, maybe a couple trades here and there. And I let, uh, I let everybody, kind of exchange ideas and and talk about things and where we might be going and what's been going on. And so you do investing and trading as well, like shorter term, sh shorter term trades. Where's your, where's your happy medium in there? Do you do both? Um, my happy medium's probably mid to long term. Now, um, you know, that, is defined differently by everybody, right? So mm -hmm. for me, trading, you know, I'm not one that typical. There's always exceptions. You know, I will trade certain earnings reports or if there's an event I want to capture, you know, that would be considered very short term. But, you know, a good range for me is, you know, three months to 10 years, right? So, um, you know, I rarely go like inside of a month, unless there's, like I said, there's an event I'm trying to capture for like a binary trade where it's mm -hmm. going to be all or nothing. Um, and that I usually do through options, not stock. Um, that was going to be my next question. Was that normally done through, through options for your, for your shorter? Holdings? Yeah. My shorter trains are normally done through options just because you can get more leverage. And if you believe what you're trading, um, you know, there's, adv there's advantages to doing so. Um, as opposed to buying stock, which takes a lot more capital. Um, but option trading is very dangerous. I would say maybe 5% of the people who are involved in markets should be involved in options as far as naked calls, naked sales, and things of that nature. Now, there's things like covered calls and covered rights and things like that, which are good income producers and are more of a safe haven for people who are trying to generate income or if you're um, knowledgeable how the options markets work, if you want to take on trades that are more neutral, like iron condors or things like that, where you're hoping for some non-volatility and just to make the premiums that you bring in um, 
you know, I think that's okay. But as far as just naked selling of puts and calls, it should be very limited to a very small amount of people in the population who are, are trading in markets. Yeah. And those iron condors, those kind of trades are good for trading in a choppy market, which we've seen a lot of recently, right? Is that where you normally place those kind of trades? Right. You're you're hundred percent right. So in this market where personally I see it just a lot of chop, I don't think we're going to get a yeah. big upside. I don't think we're going to get a big downside. It's going to kind of be in a range all year. I've always said it's going to be plus or minus single digits. I think the, uh, the trades that used to work like straddles and strangles and things like that are, are going to be very hard to be successful. You need, you know, first of all, in options, you need, you know, what I call TVD, right? You need to get the timing right. You need to get the velocity right. And you need to get the direction right. You need to be right. all three to be right to be successful. And what you're missing now is velocity and direction. So, and then that also throws your timing off. So it's very hard right now to get big moves, as you've seen, even things like the VIX, even when the market goes down, it doesn't get much above 22, 23. So yeah, I think as opposed to what I normally do, collecting premium and playing for um, ranges is probably the way to make the best returns in 23. Okay. And I know that you are primarily a fund a fundamentals trader, and I definitely want to get into that. But do technicals come into play with your options at all? And, and maybe technicals is the wrong word, but the mathematics, the 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 Greeks, are you factoring that in too, or is it okay? No, so I don't use charts. I don't use like, oh, I'm going to enter here if it hits $75.62. That's some retracement or some Fibonacci level. I don't use any of that because I think it's, in my honest opinion, I think you can make a chart look like anything you want. And if you want to make a trade, you can make the chart that defends making that trade. Well, because um, humans want to see the pattern that we have a tendency to pick up the patterns that we want to see. Right. Right. And 100 percent. And to be honest with you, 90 percent of the people that are on FinTwit are technical traders. Right. You know, you see a lot of chartists. You see a lot of people talking about levels and and, you know, support and resistance and things like that. Um, I've never used a chart in my entire life. Um, for me, it's always been about the macro, the fundamentals, feel um, and where you see momentum and what, you know, um, verticals and, and businesses over the next X time period are going to be successful. But yeah, so when it comes to buying options, I, I do look at the Greeks. Um, you know, I try to target a certain delta, which is how much, you know, um, an option will change for every change in the underlying asset. Um, you know, my range is usually like 0.35 to 0.5. Now, normally at the money calls are 0.5 on either side okay. of the fence. Um, is that for buying and selling? Your Delta correct. range stays the same? Okay. Yes. So, and, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but, you know, what a Delta really represents is in the moneyness. And that's what the percentage is for, you know, a lot of pros use. So in other words, if your Delta is 0.25, there's a 25% chance that that option is going to end up in the money. So, you know, that's a quick and dirty kind of, it's not, a, it's, it's not exact. It's, it's pretty close though. Um, you know, um, for, so for me, you know, if I give myself a 35 to 50% chance of being in the money, you know, that's my comfort zone. I'm not a lotto player. Um, I think it's a waste of money. I think it's damaging. Um, I think it became all the rage in 2020 because everybody made tons of money and now all those people are broke. Um, and on the opposite side, I don't like to go too deep in the money either because I'm not looking for a stock substitute. I'm looking for leverage. And if I'm taking you want that enough gamut risk, curve, right? right? Correct. Correct. A hundred percent. So, um, you know, you're fighting against, you know, decay, which is theta. But, um, you know, if you look, the relationship between calls and puts is always one. The absolute value of the of a call and a put with no dividends at the same strike is going to add up to one on either side of the fence. So if you have a 0.58 delta on the call, the same opposite put is going to be a 0.42 on the put. So, you know, there, 
they're useful for me in, in calibrating a trade, but I don't look at any other technical readings to enter the trade. I don't, you know, uh, to me, it, there, there's a lot more to that than, you know, um, candles and, and things like that. That's just my view. Mm -hmm. One <clears> of the <throat> things that you said was um, you're passionate about being passionate about what you are investing in. And I really like that, uh, that, that saying, can you, I guess, go a little bit deeper on that and elaborate um, maybe with some red flags that you look for and definitely green flags that you look for when you're reviewing a company's fundamentals, like kind of off the bat before you dig in very deep, just off the bat, like what catches your eye? Sure. So you know, the first thing I look for is the best in class, right? I try to find the best in class for whatever industry I decide I want to target. And I kind of went through this exercise in Infinity um, where let's identify, we laid out all the different um, kinds of industries. And then we tried to narrow it down based on where the economy was and where it would be going and which companies would excel. And we eliminated some and, you know, we, we um, talked about which ones would be good. And then we narrowed it down. And within that industry, we went and tried to identify the, the companies that would be the best in that. And, and for me, when I say passionate, it's, it's, it's got to be an industry that I understand, mm -hmm. um, that I've participated in in some degree, and that I really think is something that could thrive given where either the stock was to where I think it could go or where the industry is to where I think it can ultimately end up going. Um, you know, Wynn Resorts is a perfect example for me. Um, you know, back in November, I bought a bunch of it, um, which I posted um, somewhere in the 70, low 70s. And my main reasoning was they're the best in class at what they do. Um, as far as operating owners and operators, you know, a majority of their income came from China, which got obviously was hammered and, you know, they were on lockdown. So mm -hmm. you knew eventually the lockdowns were going to have to end. And when they did, you knew that this earnings machine was going to be able to turn on. And, you know, the stock was just meandering. Um, uh, Tillman Fertitta took a big stake and that gave it its first pop. And, you know, since then, China reopened, you know, they just came out yesterday and said Macau is doing better than they imagined. Um, Las Vegas is killing it. Um, and, you know, now they have an activist investor. So I just think and it's gone from 72. I think it closed close to 116 today. Um, so it's it's something that I believe in um, and something I think can still continue to go higher. As far as the opposite side, there's things I you know, I don't trust. So whereas I like Win because it had that China exposure, which I knew was coming online, I still will never directly invest in a pure Chinese company, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm passionate that, you know, they don't get audited with, um, you know, US big four financial firms. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're dealing with a communist country where you don't understand the rules and the rules can change every day. And that's a, and that's a headwind to win, but on the same token, win did very well in spite of the fact they weren't getting any revenue from China. So what uh, about, so with a, a, sorry, what about with a company okay. that, like LVS that sold everything that they had in Las Vegas and went directly to China. So does that, so that would change your fundamental thesis on that company? Correct. Like if I was okay. an investor in LVS and they sold their American properties, then I would, that's to me a big fundamental change. And at that point I have to assess where the new risks are. And if it's something I want to be a part of now with LVS, they also have, you know, a big casino in Singapore, big casino, a big casino in Singapore. So it's not, you know, they do have China exposure, but they do have a lot of exposure in Singapore and other countries other than just China. And now mm -hmm. they have a lot of money to deploy. So where they're going to end up deploying that we don't know. Um, you know, I, I used to be involved in LVS uh, probably during the great financial crisis when it was almost bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it just, you know, um, I like having the U.S. exposure. So that's why I stick with Win, and, and I think, you know, they're, they're really starting to operate, um, you know, top of the tier now. Okay. While we're on the subject of specific stocks, I do have some of the questions that people submitted on Twitter. So if I can pull those up to ask you those, sure. I know, I, I think at least one of them was about a specific stock. One second. Sure. Today, how best to build a portfolio and get allocated. So if you're starting from scratch today, the best thing you would do is what I told my kids. Start with what you know, what you understand, and see and feel every day. Pick out four stocks, four companies that you really understand and kind of relate to the business. So for my kids, you know, you know they pick Starbucks, Disney, Nike, you know, companies like Under Armour, you know, companies like that, things that they bought every day, they interacted with every day, and they understood the business. So there's not a big, you know, a lot of these companies, you don't understand the business. It's like walking to a casino and playing a game you don't know. You're going to walk mm -hmm. out with no money and you're going to walk out with no money in your pockets. But you're going to have a hard lesson. Okay, now I know how to play the game, except I'm broke, right? So I would take you know, write down a list of companies, not even stocks of companies that you really admire or that you, you know, spend Apple, you know, everybody knows Apple, everybody knows Amazon and Google, you know, there's nothing wrong with starting with the big established companies that you understand and starting a starter position uh, in each one of those and allocating, you know, 25% of your funds into four different companies. And then Every quarter, you can assess whether you want to add a new company. Maybe there's a new product you started using that you really like. Um, and you're like, wow, maybe you started shopping at Lululemon and you started doing yoga. And you're like, wow, these clothes are great. They last. They don't get destroyed in the wash. You know, I could wear them 100 times. You know, oh, God, they, you know, they're doing pretty good. I'll buy some stock in Lululemon. Or mm. if you don't feel comfortable, you just keep dollar cost averaging into the positions you already have. Okay. That's I mean, that's, advice. that's how I would do it. Yeah. This one from Royal blue rain. Why are fundamentals more effective than charts is, I guess you kind of already answered that because anyone can make it, can see what they want to see. Right. <laughs> well, I think fundamentals speak to what's actually going on and, you know, charts don't take into account events. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, you know, the stock drops 20%. Well, oh, the chart wasn't, you know, and, and, and on a rising chart, uh, well, the stock was, the chart wasn't going to tell you that, that, oh, by the way, they had earnings or, oh, by the way, they just, you know, lost big customer. So I don't think it takes into account real life practical activities. And it's not letting you use your eyes to invest. It's letting you use a, a, a chart, which you can, like I said, manipulate the lines to kind of meet your argument. But I don't think it takes into account what's going on in the world or the economy um, per se, depending on how long your timeline is. Now, if you want to do an intraday trade and you use charts, by all means, God bless you and good luck. Um, <laughs> that's not my expertise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I like to, you know, take a company break it down, see where it fits into the whole puzzle and then assess whether, you know, it's going to go from the lower left to the upper right or whether it's in a downtrend. Um, you know, so I think fundamentals give you a broader picture and a bigger chance to get it right. And also it'll allow you to um, accept more gains because if you have sell, you know, you have certain levels that you are only going to buy or sell into, you might miss the buy because it didn't come down 50 cents more into your level, right? Oh, it didn't drop that extra 50 cents. Now I just missed a 15% run up because you were dollar wise and, and, and penny foolish. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I just think it gives you a broader view of, of the entire market. This person had another couple questions for you. Not only do they want to know why you are so good looking, they also <laughs> want to know, if we are already in a recession or we will be in 2023. So, and do your looks affect that answer 
I'm sure they'll want to know. <laughs> I, yeah, not, I'm not uh, the youngest of chickens anymore. So no, I don't <laughs> think my looks will affect any of my answers. Um, however, I do agree with, you know, a friend of mine, Kenny Paul Carey, who, you know, says we're in a rolling recession. And I, and I do kind of put some credence into that in that as we go along, different parts of the economy are going to fall into recession and different parts are going to come out and different um, industries are going to be impacted differently. So I don't think it's a typical recession where you have high unemployment and, uh, and companies earnings are, are dropping because of that. I think you're going to have uh, some earnings slow down. You might have some multiple compression, but nobody's getting laid off really. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, other than the tech, you're not hearing about big layoffs. My dog insists of every time I'm doing a webcast to pick up the squeaky toy. So just excuse him. <laughs> not right now. Um, yeah, that's his way of getting attention. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I just don't think that, you know, with the employment levels we have right now, until we start to see other industries lay off. And I think they're tentative to do that because it was so hard to hire coming out of the pandemic you know, they're willing to suffer a little pain to keep their good employees this time because the process to get them to onboard new employees was so painful that, you know, people still have their jobs. People are still spending. They're just paying more for stuff, right? And, you know, they might be downshifting into the type of stuff they're buying. You know, they might not be shopping at Whole Foods anymore. They might be shopping at Target or Walmart for their food, but they're still spending. So, as long as that continues, I don't think we're going to have this full-blown nasty recession. Now, the caveat is if rates start to inch towards 6%, I think all bets are off. I think it's going to be quite calamitous. I don't know if that would be the case. Uh, but it, I, I think the market can get used to a 4 to 5% Fed funds rate. Um, and, you know, that'll bring inflation in. Um, it's going to take a while because there's some stick to it to it. Um, on the supply side, which so we can't control. That, right. And do you think that the interest rates alone, uh, upping those will be enough to bring down inflation? Whereas, you know, they want to see that unemployment rate rise as well. If we don't see the unemployment rate rise, do you think the interest rate, interest rates going up will be enough? I think it'll be enough to bring inflation down, but it's going to take a lot longer than they wanted it to take. I don't think I don't see rates getting cut for 12 to 18 months. I think we're we're in this period right now where they're going to leave them higher for longer because there's things we just higher interest rates can't impact, right? It's not going to make more food. It's not going to make right. more oil. It's not really it's it's not impacting the supply, you know, we're we're like 1.6 or 1.7 million houses short in this country than we need. So the supply of housing is is very, very short. Now, you know, and then you have the conundrum of, well, if you have a 3% mortgage, why are you going to sell the move into a 7% mortgage? And right. the buyers are having the same conundrum where now their affordability has been chopped. So housing is going to slow, but I don't think you're going to see a big pricing decline, if that makes sense. Right. Um, and um, I think it's going to be this meander for all of 23. I think 23 is going to be just kind of like a meandering chop walkthrough of just people thinking, okay, we're through it. We're going to make go make higher highs and then nope, back down to the range, you know, 37, so 3,800. So what you're saying is they're going to continue to argue on Twitter constantly, the well, bears and the bulls. <laughs> has that ever stopped? I no, mean, but it's know. just those no, macro but you got to be pragmatic. <laughs> No, it's not. I mean, you know, you got to be pragmatic and, you know, you can make so you can make money on both sides. Now, right. I am not a big put buyer, but I will use um, index puts to hedge my long positions. So I won't okay. short individual names per se, but if I have a bucket of options, let's say, or let's say stocks, a bucket of stocks, I'll buy some SPX puts to hedge that, to hedge against that, you know, or some triple Q puts or, or things like that. Um, 
you know, um, I, I've just been one to try to minimize my losses in the bad times and maximize my gains when I feel comfortable. That's actually one of the, that goes into one of the questions. Another question we had was how do you manage risk in your portfolio? And you do that through he- through hedging essentially, right? And go ahead and elaborate right. so, on that. I know. So rally, I mean, most people want to know how they hedge out all the risk, but you got to understand the purpose of a hedge is not to hedge out all the risk. Now, um, if you have a bucket of an options portfolio, you can add up all the deltas, right? And that's your delta. And that's what you need to hedge against. Mm -hmm. So if you add up all your deltas and let's say you have 10 positions of options and all your deltas add up to, let's say three. You know, you could take that bucket of three and that's how much, you know, you need to short to hedge that whole portfolio, you know, Mm -hmm. 3.0. So for me, um, I I take risk by position sizing. That's how I manage my risk. Mm -hmm. I don't really do it based on buying a lot of puts or or calls to offset individual positions. I do it by managing the size of the position when I go in. And do you, um, do you also, you don't, you don't ever trade in futures, do you? I used to trade in futures, but the danger with the futures is they're mark to market every day and their margins every day. Mm-hmm. So you could, well, you the, know, you could end up going broke real quick. No, of course. The reason I was asking is, um, one of the other methods of, of hedging can be, you know, taking into account the notional value, but I think that that's more applicable in futures, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's very and prevalent in the future. Market. What are the most common mistakes beginners make when investing? Listening to too many people who think they know what they're doing. I mean, if, if you, if you if you were new, right? If let's just say you're a new new investor and you're like, oh man, I I'm going to go on Twitter and I'm going to see what people think about you know doing things. You would be getting some horrific advice from ninety percent of the people on Twitter because everybody has different risk profile, everybody has a different growth profile, everybody has a different capital structure profile, and you need to understand what you're comfortable with whatever you can sleep at night with that's what i always use the sleep at night comparison if you're going to bed at night thinking shit the market's down big tomorrow i'm gonna be i'm crushed i don't know if i could sleep thinking you know when you know when it's not happening right now but there was a time you know there was a lot of volatility you know you wake up at one in the morning and the futures are down seven eight nine hundred and if that kept you up at night, then you are way too risk curved. You right. need to slant back your risk to where you're comfortable. You can go to bed at night and be like, you know what? If the market tanks tomorrow, I got some money on the side. The positions will go down, but I'm pretty well diversified and I'm not worried about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't listen to anybody else. You know, um, I'm really big on self-educating. Um, learn about what you're doing, learn about what you're buying, learn about what you own. Um, you can find a trusted confidant to help you, but, um, too many people, um, too many people, um, come on here and just listen to people who are spewing some really bad advice. And and that's most of the, re- most of the reason why I started infinity mm-hmm. is so they can avoid those pitfalls. You know, the people who are selling subs and front running and, you know, playing yeah. lottos and, you know, it's it's really toxic. It's really bad. Um, and the only ones that are really making money are the people selling it to you. Well said. <laughs> I can I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, I, you know, me... I always use the comparison. Where are all the where are all the customers yachts? Where are all the yeah. customers Ferraris, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. No. And then you know what? Some of them do end up, you know, getting lucky on some of their calls, especially if it's a momentum stock or it, but it's just not sustainable in the long well, run. And this year, this year they've been destroyed. Yeah. 
I mean, there, there is no, no, no we've seen uh, an increase in subscription services. <laughs> the market has gone down. <laughs> so I think, I think. Yeah, that because, should... because, pe right. Yeah. Because people don't know what to do. Yep. So they're desperate. They're desperate for information. They're desperate to have someone tell them what to do. And that's the biggest pitfall. You don't, yeah. you, you need to educate yourself so that you know what to do. What do you think about Google? We'll get over 200 in three years. Adam wants to know. Yes. Okay. I think Google is a answer. market leader. <laughs> yes. I think Google is a market leader. I think Google is one of the best in class. You know, they're, everybody's worried about the chat um, issue that Microsoft, you know, the C CPT chat and that Google's product wasn't as refined. But everybody got to remember what Apple, they, they have the same kind of model as Apple. Apple lets everybody go first screw it up and then they come out with a product that's a hundred times better remember when everybody microsoft came out with the zune and all these yeah. mp3 players were coming out and then apple came out with this great little thing with the circle in the middle called an ipod yeah. and and took over so mm -hmm. google, google will find its way um and like i said if, the, if something changes in that where they lose their market leadership then that's a fundamental change and i would reconsider my i'm not so I don't have so much hubris that I can't be wrong or my view can't change if the right, facts change. Right. So, you know, but some people, you know, go down with the, go down with the flames. That's true. They'd rather and, be right than make money. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one last question, because um, I know yeah. we're running a little short on time, but uh, why do some companies file form 424B2? There's a specific company that this person is asking about. I don't know if you've heard of I that. I don't know anything about that company, so I don't even nope. want to comment on it because I just okay. think that, you know, that, would be, that would be doing them a disservice. Yeah. No, I, pre I appreciate you know. the honesty. Thank you. No, I, you know, so, you know, you got to know what you don't know. And if you don't know it, then you hire people who do know, right? I mean, um, you know, that's, that's part of success is, is understanding the things you're good at and using that to amplify the things that you're not mm -hmm. well said thank you so much for coming on and speaking with me is there anything sure. else you wanted to say before we head off yeah i would like to just say that um you know mental health is a big part of people's lives and when it comes to trading and investing uh, and and your mental health if you feel you are not in a good place then the best thing you could do is clear the mechanism, step away, whether it's an hour, whether it's a day, a week, a month, however long it needs to be till you feel you're in a good place. Because what happens is you'll have angry trades. Um, it'll, it'll ripple through your life to your family and, and maybe your job and, and it becomes really toxic. So there'll always be another trade out there. There'll always be another investment. You aren't going to miss anything. Don't think about FOMO. Think about getting yourself right um, and, and, and coming back with a clear head because I think that's really important. Absolutely. That's one of my favorite topics, getting into trading. And I'll have to have you back sometime so we can specifically dive into that topic. Absolutely. I would love that. I would, I would absolutely awesome. love to be a part of that. Absolutely. And good luck with this. This is great. Thank you. I'm going to hold you to it. He's uh, he's more than just some guy on Twitter who claims he knows how to trade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks, Erica. You too. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Want more Trader Babes? Subscribe now and connect with us on social media for exclusive content and access you won't find anywhere else. And we'll see you right here on the next unforgettable episode of Trader Babes.